Jerusalem recognizes the fact that there was a Jewish state and a Jewish temple there before the creation of the religion. Um, our question is, again, when do you start the clock? At a later point in time, various empires managed to conquer the land that we now call Israel and that they call Palestine. If you look at the legal history of it, you know, the Jews weren't given the land. Eventually, the world recognized their rightful claim and the fact that they had been there for unbroken 4,000 years. Um, and so we celebrate the fact that the world recognized it, but we predated the United Nations and the horrors of the Holocaust. It wasn't given to us as a gift. As Winston Churchill, who was then the Secretary of State for the colonies, said when they passed the mandate, the Jews are there as of right, not on sufferance. And so we were there. Um, the, the Arab world would like to start the clock from the last time that Islam ruled the area, but there's no real reason, either legally, historically, or religiously, to start the clock there. No. Israel's legitimacy, again, is not rooted in the beneficence of others. Israel was there because it's theirs. You know, when, when Israel was in its foundational stages before the foundation of the state, it was Jewish people coming to expand the existing community by buying land and cultivating it. We have those deeds. It's not like this is made up. So to pretend that uh, somehow it was an apology, the Jews have given it. As some politicians have said, you know, Rashida Floyd, for example, said it gives her a warm feeling to think that her ancestors helped after the Holocaust. They did. That her ancestors supported the Nazis. And the Jews were there because they earned it and because they owned it. No, that's laughably silly. The majority of Jews in Israel today, 70%, are of uh, Middle Eastern and North African descent. Only 30% are European descended, or even could be considered white. It's an imposition of an entire racial conflict that does not have anything to do with it. It feeds into the false narrative of BDS of Israel as a colonialist, aggressive, uh, you know, aggressor, apartheid sort of state. Absolutely not. It's, it's completely and utterly wrong. Unfortunately, the way the anti-Semitism works is that Jews are considered whatever is unfashionable at the time. By the way, Jews weren't even considered white until it became unfashionable to be white. In the United States was always a debate whether Jews should be counted as white. Now that whites are seen as oppressors, Jews are definitely whites. Whatever society doesn't like a particular moment, that becomes Jewish. Nowadays, where there's a, a popular resistance and social justice movement to help the black community, um, people try to say that the Jews are not a colored community or they're not ethnically different than the whites in other parts of the world. You can't occupy land that you own. Under legal history, Israel has both title and sovereignty to the disputed territories. So very briefly, in 1922, the League of Nations created a mandate for Palestine that included the West Bank. In fact, you get the word settlement from part of that language of the mandate, which said that the Jews should have established close settlement on the land. Okay, so the mandatory lines included what is now the disputed territory. Now, in 1947, the UN did offer a partition plan, which the outer world rejected. So the mandate lines remained unrevised. Under the actual international law of Uti Positatis Juris, when a nation emerges, it inherits its pre-administrative boundaries, its pre-independence administrative boundaries, which means that Israel, the only nation that emerged because the Arabs rejected the plan, inherited the entire mandate, which means that they had title to the land. Now, for a period of 19 or so years, uh, Jordan and Egypt illegally occupied parts of that land. And then in 1967, in yet another defensive war against a host of Arab armies, Israel reclaimed sovereignty over land it already had title to. There's never been another country there. Jordan never really claimed that they owned the land. They were there entirely as aggressors. If there ever was an occupation, it was between uh, 1948 and 1967. also laughable. I mean, the, the kingmaker of the new Israeli parliament was the head of the Islamist Ram party. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's disingenuous and it's also disrespectful to what happened in South Africa. And I'll tell you, you know, there are, it goes back to our question about international law. There are two accepted international law definitions of apartheid, but both of them involve a systematic uh, regime of trying to dominate uh, another group and to keep it that way to maintain it. Israel has made as of now at least 34 offers of peace 
uh, trying to fix the problem. You simply can't have apartheid when one side keeps on trying to make peace. You might say that any one, two, 10, 15 of those offers weren't good offers. Fine. Some of them were so good that they were actually accepted by the rest of the Arab world. For example, in 2001, the Saudi prince Bandar told Arafat, if you didn't accept the Clinton peace parameters, it wasn't just a tragedy, it was a crime. And so you can't have apartheid when one side is literally trying to give up land to make peace. In fact, in 2008, Ulmer offered up to 99.3% of the disputed territory, more than anyone, in my opinion, rationally should. But he still declined it. That's not a point. That's another thing where the media, unfortunately, conflates two different terms, disproportionate and asymmetrical. Again, in essence, what does disproportionate mean? It doesn't just mean the numbers are different. Disproportionate is a legal term. It comes from Article 82B4 of the Rome Statute, which governs in this area. It has a precise definition. It says that expected civilian casualties can be excessive in relation to the anticipated military advantage gained. A couple things about that definition. One, it tells you that not all civilian casualties are criminal. In fact, some of them are to be expected. It's also prospective. It's a commander in the field making decisions in real time with information that they have. It's not an armchair quarterback 10 days later counting up bodies. You cannot do that in war. You can't have an effects based analysis that looks at how many people died to determine whether an action was legal. You know why? Because if you do that, you actually incentivize somebody else or incentivize human shields. This precise reason people call it disproportionate is why Hamas hides bombs behind civilians in hospitals and shelters and in schools, because they know that under this illegal effects-based analysis that confuses the crime of disproportionism and other things, uh, they'll be rewarded for more dead bodies. What people need to say is that it's asymmetrical, right? There are more deaths. Asymmetrical is a non-legal comparison of facts and numbers. There's better technology on the Israeli side. There's more death on the Palestinian side. That's a function of Israel investing in defense instead of in terror tunnels. Ask them, when someone tells you that, ask them which law. Ask them to specifically tell you which international law they're violating. I'll guarantee you that 90% of them can't. The 10% that answer you will say something along the lines of, well, uh, Israel is violating the Geneva Conventions or Resolution 242 of the United Nations. People think that Israel is a violation of international law because the UN General Assembly has said so over 5,000 times. The UN General Assembly is a political body, not a legislative body. Israel has not violated international law. The only part of the UN that could ever say that Israel actually violated international law and have some meaning to it would be the Security Council operating under their Chapter 7 powers. And that's never happened because Israel hasn't violated the law. So what I would ask them to do is to be precise. Tell me exactly which law and how Israel violated it. And I'm assuming that will be the end of the conversation.